Hello everybody, Chaplain Bob here. Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part five of Falling Away, the great falling away. You know, the falling away started from the pulpits. Yeah, that's right. But also the people. You know, the thing is, when you've got people that love God's Word and read it, you, they can't slip in a satanic pastor. It just won't work, because when they teach falsehood, the congregation will get rid of him. But uh, today, people are so ignorant of God's Word. Ignorant means you, you don't know something. You know, like uh, brain surgery. I'm ignorant of brain surgery. The Bible I'm not ignorant of. Um, I don't claim to be an expert or a prophet. Nope. But um, I just have a good overview. I would, I feel. Now, back when the pilgrims and Puritans came to America, they were a godly people for the most part. And they were a praying people. And a, a Bible was a very cherished item. I mean, you know, printing books was, uh, it was, they were valuable. I mean, there were people that considered their, their Bibles the most, their most valuable possession. And boy, has that changed. You know, the, um, from of what I understand, I think it was the, the Pilgrims or the Puritans, I forget which, uh, when they came over, it wasn't even the King James that they brought. They brought the uh, Geneva Bible, which, I, as far as I know, I mean, I haven't tested it and checked it completely, but uh, uh, the Geneva Bible's pretty close to the King James. I had a facsimile of the Geneva, and I compared some scriptures with it and they were pretty close you know the words might have been in a different order but it basically the the thought was the same it's, uh, it's just that uh king james did not like some of the notes in the geneva bible but uh john calvin was one of the major players in creating the geneva bible um I've heard pros and cons about Calvin, but you know what? Jesus is going to be the ultimate judge. Either depart from me, I never knew you, or um, well done, faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He's going to make that decision, not me. Uh, when it comes to people like Joel Olstein, yeah, I'll, you know, we're supposed to be fruit inspectors. And I don't see any fruit. But, uh, all right, so let's get going here. Now, back in the days when you had people like Jonathan Edwards who were preaching sermons like sinners in the hands of an angry God, people were crying in the aisles and saying, what must I do to be saved? Lord, forgive me. You don't hear that stuff anymore. I mean, there's you don't hear preaching about sin and repentance anymore, hardly at all. I mean, it's it's sad. And it's all been gradual. And like I mentioned, but in previous studies, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they were all Bible colleges. And Today, they're anything but sad people. Well, let's take a look at a little bit of history. 
the America would um, not have fought the Civil War had we been a godly nation. And yeah, I know they'll tell you, oh, well, we fought the Civil War about slavery. No, it wasn't. It was about state rights. And trust me, I wish slavery had never happened. I wish the black slaves had never come to America. I, you know, truly, I wish they never had. Matter of fact, Lincoln was going to repatriate them back to Africa, but he was killed, and then that plan was scrubbed. Perhaps you've heard of uh, Liberia and Monrovia. That was a country in Africa that the United States had repatriated blacks from the United States and sent them back to Africa so that they could be free and not be oppressed by the white man. I think it's a very good idea. But uh, what can I tell you? But the, um, the thing is, people, I would say probably 95% or more of the churches and people, very few know about the two sea lines in the Bible. You know, and we're talking about Genesis 6, the Canaanites, who Esau intermarried with. Very few will touch on that. I mean, the churches want you to think that, you know, God doesn't have any enemies. They just want you to think that, um, you know, just people that haven't been told the gospel so that they can get saved. Well, let's take a look at a few things. And you decide. Well, I covered a lot of that in part four, but we're going to look at some more. Now, in Romans 9.13, Paul acknowledges, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And what is he reiterating? Malachi 1 and verse 3 where God says through the prophet Malachi, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And Satan is called the dragon, the old serpent, in Revelation chapter 12. You could read it. If you don't know who the dragon is, well, you need to read your Bible cover to cover. Now, you know, you're going to tell me, a preacher's going to tell me that God died for everybody? Really? So there's going to be Esau has a possibility to go to heaven when God hates him? Really? Well, how about Obadiah, one of the minor prophets, chapter 1 and verse 18? And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble. And what's stubble? Something that's flammable, something you burn. And the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any, any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. Does that sound like Esau and his family have a chance for salvation? Ah, uh, it doesn't sound like it to me. But, uh, and Josephus, a Jewish historian, says that uh, King Herod was uh, of the house of Esau. Esau Edom. You know, the guy that tried to kill all the, killed Christ in Bethlehem when he was born, killed all the children under what, two years old or something, all the male children? Oh, yeah. Nice guy that Herod is, right? Now, perhaps um, God hated Esau because Esau hated God. Now, remember, the book of Psalms was written by David, for the most part. 
And um, David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Why was God, uh, King David a man after God's own heart? Well, my opinion is this, and there could be other reasons, but the two main ones is one is that when um, Goliath was mocking Israel, David knew and believed the Lord when he said that God was going to give Israel the land and was going to exterminate the Canaanites and the Philistines, the giants, which were the satanic seed line. He knew this, and he stood on the promises, and he's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that, you know, uh, that uh, I forget exactly what he said, but, you know, basically, who is this guy mocking the armies of the Lord? You know, I mean, everybody else was afraid of Goliath, but not David. David knew the Lord's hand was going to be against the Philistines, and they would not be able to stand. And when David faced Goliath with his sling, he knew that the Lord's hand was going to guide that stone. I mean, he knew. He stood on the promises of God. Let's read Psalms 106. And uh, I'll give you a little commentary here and there. Verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. I did a Bible study called that, For his mercy endureth forever. Verse 2, Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation. You know, there are so many preachers that'll, and, well, I, I you know, wolves in sheep's clothing, hirelings, that will uh, tell you that uh, the, the Old Testament's nothing but law. That's not true. There's grace and salvation found in the Old Testament. Hadn't been fulfilled, but, um, you know, we just read, O oh, visit me with thy salvation, verse 5, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. We have sinned. Those are probably three of the most loved words of the Lord is when we when we acknowledge our wickedness we have sinned with our fathers we have committed iniquity we have done wickedly our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt they remembered not the multitude of thy mercies but provoked him at the sea even at the Red Sea Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. You know what? Sometimes God will do things just for his own honor, not because of us, but in spite of us and our lack of faith and obedience. Verse 10, And he the Lord, and he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Now we're probably talking about the uh, armies of Pharaoh being covered with the Red Sea uh, when Moses, they crossed the Red Sea and the, the Egyptian army followed them and was all drowned. Verse 12, then believed they his words, they sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, 
but sent leanness into their soul. They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. If I remember correctly, these uh, challenged the authority of Moses. And let me tell you something, people. If God the Father sends Christ and Christ sends Moses and you challenge Moses, you're in big trouble. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, don't touch the Lord's anointed. Unfortunately, the wolves use that a lot, but, uh, you know, they think or they proclaim themselves the Lord's anointed, but uh, Moses was the Lord's anointed. I mean, miracle after miracle, God wrought for the hand of Moses to proclaim that he was whom the Lord sent. So, verse 18. And a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. And they changed their glory into, into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham. Sorry, that's not Smithfield, Ham. Now, we're talking about um, one of the three sons of Noah that came from the ark. You had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan and the Canaanites. And Egypt is known as the land of Ham. They were not the chosen seed line. Wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them, had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. You know, Moses, uh, God told Moses he was going to destroy Israel. And Moses said, well, if you're going to destroy them, destroy me too. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but he, and he was serious about it. And the Lord had mercy because Moses interceded for the children of Israel. You know, I remember he said, Lord, if blot me out of, blot my name out of your book, the book of life. Blot me out of the book. I mean, that takes, that takes some, you know, that takes a lot of, I guess you could say guts. You know, but uh, because of Moses, the Lord didn't do it. So, therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. See, that's why, that's why the Lord loved David. David believed. David had faith. King David had faith. Uh, one of the other keys of why the Lord loved David was because David was not perfect, especially in the matter with Bathsheba. And uh, he had her husband killed, Uriah. And, um, but you know what? When the prophet, I think it was Samuel, confronted David, David acknowledged his sin and repented. 
You know, some people never repent. They'll never acknowledge that they were wrong. You know, somebody asked Donald Trump, and I got the video, I've seen the video somewhere. I don't know if this computer has it. My other computer up in Arkansas has it, but uh, if that computer still exists, I don't know. But uh, somebody asked Donald Trump if he'd ever asked God for forgiveness. And he, he hawed around and, you know, told a long story about, oh, you know, Norman Vincent Peale, my pastor. And, you know, Norman Vincent Peale was the uh, power of positive thinking guy. You know, all you got to do is think positive and it'll turn out. You know, oh, you want that million dollars? Well, keep believing that you're going to get a million dollars. Well, you know what? The only way you're going to get that million dollars is if the Lord wants you to have that million dollars. But finally, when, when Trump finally got around his little political speech there, the guy said, but Donald, Mr. Trump, did you ever ask the Lord forgiveness? And you know what he said? He said, no, I just try to do better. Try to do better. That's not repentance. You know, repentance is asking the Lord for forgiveness and then changing the things that displease the Lord, which King David did. So David had faith and David had repentance. I think those were the keys of David. If some of you people know other something else that I forgot, leave it in a comment. Um, I learn a lot from people's comments. A lot. Sometimes things that I miss, you know. I don't claim to be a know-it-all. I mean, I'm just some schmo that too much time on my hand to do Bible studies. So, yea, they, Israel, they despise the pleasant land. They believe not his word. You know, God was taking them out of Egypt, and he was going to bring them into the promised land. He's told them, I'm going to give you cities with houses that you didn't have to build, with fruit trees that you didn't have to plant, with vineyards that you didn't have to plant, and crops that you didn't have to break your back and, and clear the land and, and plant and do all these things. I'm going to bring you into a land with milk and honey. And what did they do? Oh, we want to go back to Egypt. We miss those leeks and onions and garlic. What? You idiots, you've been slaves for how many years? Uh, you want to go back to Egypt? You don't believe the Lord? He's going to give you a land of milk and honey. When you kill the Canaanites, you're going to take their homes. You're going to take their vineyards. You're going to take their fruit trees, their fig trees. You're going to take their date trees, their date palms. You're going to take all that. The Lord gave it to you. And you know what? The devil's children knew where the promised land was. And they went there. And they were going to oppose God's people. Think about that. They had no right to the land, but they were there anyways. And God told Israel, get rid of them. But what did they do? Verse 25. But murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed, their children, also among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor, that's a satanic god, and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Not the sacrifices to the Lord, no. Verse 29. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and the plague break in upon them. 
Then stood up Phineas and executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. What did Phineas do? There was an Israelite man that took a Canaanite woman, and he was, how do I put this gently for the women? Let's just say he was on top of her, pretending that he was married to her and it was their honeymoon. If you catch my drift. Phineas took a spear and put it through the back of the man and through the belly of the woman. Took the spear and put it through both of them when he was on top of her. Um, having his physical pleasure. The Lord was so pleased with Phineas after Israel was told not to have, take these women that uh, God gave Phineas a priesthood. Yeah, Phineas was given a priesthood, a special priesthood. And executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. God was pleased with Phineas. 31. And that was counted unto him for righteousness. <laughs> Phineas killed a man and a woman. And that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forever. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. Because they provoked his spirit, so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips, they did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them. What nations? The Canaanite nations. They didn't do it. The men looked at the women and said, Hmm, boy, she's a looker. I would like to have her. Instead of doing what the Lord commanded, they married them. These human, satanic, fallen angel hybrids that 95% plus of the churches deny that even exists. And if you don't believe me, Go to, go to my homepage, click on my name, go to the homepage, look up playlists, and along the playlists, look, look up where it says the angels that sinned. Go spend five or ten hours in that series and tell me that I'm wrong. Fallen angels. People, I'm sorry, believers and unbelievers do not get married and have giants for children, especially with six fingers and six toes. Doesn't happen. They were satanic hybrids. God said, exterminate them. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen. That's right. The men marry the women and, and, and uh, the heathen satanic women. And the daughters married the heathen satanic men. But were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. That's right. They learned to worship the devils. And they served their idols, which were a snare, a trap, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Human sacrifice. Can you imagine they sacrifice their children to the devil? And that, you think, you think anything's different today? Do you know how many thousands of children disappear in this country every year? Especially around Christmas, Easter, and Halloween. You take a look at the a few weeks before those three times, over half the, the, the kidnappings that happen in the weeks before those three major dates. It's unbelievable. There's a reason why the Lord said to kill witches. There's a reason why he said to kill wizards. And the churches today will be bleeding hearts Oh, but, but we should preach Jesus to them. They might get saved. Uh, possibly, if they're not satanic seed. 
possibly. But the Bible doesn't say to spare them, to preach to them. The Bible says to get rid of them. Maybe you should care more about the children that get kidnapped and murdered than worrying about the person doing the killing. You wonder why God's curses are upon America? Our economy is on the verge of collapsing. Today is April 21 in the year 2020. I don't know how much longer I'll be on YouTube. I'll be on BitChute maybe. But um, God's curses are upon America. The economy is collapsing. People have been out of work for five and six weeks now because of this COVID so-called virus. And somebody just pointed out to me that this COVID, well, different spelling, is a word from Kabbalah, which is witchcraft and Satanism masquerading as Judaism. Has reference to the Shekinah, the goddess, the queen of heaven, which they dare call the Holy Spirit, the wife of God the Father. And you wonder why God's blessing America? Really? You don't? You can't figure it out, huh? Yea, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto devils. What about abortion? You know, there was a nurse that worked in an abortion clinic and she just couldn't take it anymore. You know, she saw partial birth abortion and she just, her spirit was just broken and she repented and, and asked the Lord for forgiveness. And she did a, she was interested in finding out who owns all these abortion clinics. Take a guess who owns, owned all these abortion clinics. Uh, yeah, the Chosenites owned all the ones in the city where she lived. Take, take a guess, people, you know? Are they sacrificing our children, our sons and our daughters unto devils? I think so. Verse 38. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works, and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. Do you know that God hated even giving these people the inheritance of the covenant? I mean, that's, that's what I get from this. Maybe you see it different. Verse 41, And he gave them into the hand of the Chinese. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, that's future, I think. That's That might be a prophecy. It could be I, you know, it could be wrong, but I don't think so. But I don't claim to be a prophet. Just an educated guess. Verse 41, And he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. And that's what we have today, people. Those that hate Christians are in rulership over us. Verse 42, Their enemies also opposed them, I'm sorry, oppressed them, oppressed them. And they were brought into sub subjection under their hand. Many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. You know, people, I'm kind of of the opinion that perhaps we're entering into the time of sorrows before the Great Tribulation. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Things could be a, a lot worse. I mean, I'm just some guy that's read the Bible a couple times, you know. 
but it, it looks like it to me. I don't claim to have any special knowledge. I've asked the Lord for some things, and he's been quiet. Perhaps he's trying to teach me patience. I don't know. Maybe I'm not where I'm supposed to be with him. I mean, I know I'm not, but, you know, the thing is, when the Lord gives you knowledge, he expects greater things from you. You know, you're better off not knowing something. If you know to do something and you don't know it to do, you know, you don't do what you know to do, you're better off not knowing it. And I feel for you gals that have, that came to, you know, maybe you got married when you were unbelievers and your husbands were unbelievers. And then later on in the marriage, you became believers and your husbands still are unbelievers or perhaps they're lukewarm. I feel for you. I really do. Because the husband's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the house. And there are so few and trust me, I'm not bragging about me being a spiritual leader in my house. I mean, the only girl that ever loved me, I uh, I ruined that at a very young age. I didn't want the responsibility of a family. I just wanted to have fun. But, uh, yeah, I ruined that. And uh, now I got two girls that... Uh, don't really care if they ever see me again or not. What can I tell you? You know, you can be forgiven for sin, but you still have to live with the consequences. You know, you can, before you get saved, you can play around with uh, somebody, you know, a girl or a boy, depending upon which and you catch some kind of a disease that uh, is incurable, never goes away. I mean, the Lord can cure you, but a lot of times you'll live with the consequences of that, even though you're forgiven. It's serious. Sometimes you have to live with the consequences of sin. And I know that lesson very well. That's why, I'm, that's why I feel the way I do sometimes. All right, 42, Psalms 106, 42. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into sub subjection under their hand. Many times did he, the Lord, deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. And he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies he made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives save us o lord our god and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise blessed be the lord god of israel from everlasting to everlasting and let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. You know, we were talking about, well, I was talking about uh, the key of David. David was called a man after God's own heart. Well, in Romans 4.3, when it talks about Abraham, and Abraham was called the friend of God. What kind of a testimony is that? Romans 4.3, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Believing God is counted for righteousness, people. Most people really don't believe God. Now, one of the other things um, King David had going for him in Psalms 139, verse 21, he says, Do not I hate them, O Lord? 
that hate thee? What? But God loves everybody. Uh, according to the modern demon nominational preachers, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? Ah, King David knew the, there were those that hated the Lord, and he hated them. They were his enemies. Boy, you don't hear that preached in church, do you? No. Now, there was a king of Israel. Another thing the, the Bible preachers will never, ever, ever do. They'll never tell you that Israel and Judah were two different kingdoms. Almost none of them will tell you this. They had different capitals, Jerusalem and Samaria. They had different kings. And they had armies that fought each other. You know? I mean, let's face it. You had the North and the South in the American Civil War. They were all Americans. But if you told uh, somebody from Atlanta that they were a New Yorker, well, they'd probably punch in the mouth. They call them damn Yankees. And, uh, you know, they they were different. They fought wars against each other. But uh, Israel fell into apostasy before Judah did. They had a king that was married to a woman named Jezebel. Uh, she was of the satanic seed line. And uh, when you want to make a point about a woman that's rebellious and stubborn and evil, you call her a Jezebel. And she was married to a guy named Ahab. Well, what does the Bible say about King Ahab? Well, in 1 Kings 16.33, and Ahab made a grove. Well, why did he make a grove? So that they could do satanic sacrifices. And Ahab made a grove and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Does that sound like a testimony? And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Doesn't sound too good, does it? All right, so in 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse 1, uh, if you read the previous chapters, you'll see that uh, King Ahab was fighting, I think it was Syria. I, I don't remember exactly, but he was fighting a war. And King Ahab asked the king of Judah, Hey, uh, hey, buddy, give me a hand here, will you? I, I, I need some help. And um, the king of Judah said, "Okay, I'll help you. No problem." Well, his name was Jehoshaphat, and he was a good king. Generally. So in Second Chronicles chapter nineteen and verse one. It says, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. Now, I could prove it to you, but take my word for it. A seer was an old, Old Testament word for prophet. Before they were called prophets, they were called seers, because they would see the future. So Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him, King Jehoshaphat, and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? Should you help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Good question. Should we help the ungodly and help those that hate the Lord? Let's, let's, we'll come back to that. Therefore is wrath 
upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and thou, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. Hmm. So, should we as a nation help the ungodly and love those and bless those that hate the Lord, Jesus Christ? Is there a certain country in the Middle East that we bless? A group of people that curse Jesus Christ and blaspheme him? Should we help the ungodly and love those that hate the Lord? And your preachers will say, well, you know, God says he'll bless them that, that you know, bless them that bless thee and, and curse them that curse thee. Boy, I tell you what, if, if God blesses us any more for blessing them, we're going to be destroyed. Now, what is the definition of an antichrist? 1 John 2.22 Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Is there a group of people in the Middle East that deny that Jesus is the Christ? Well, yes, because if they believed that Jesus was the Christ, wouldn't they be Christians? Indeed, they would. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. In 1 Corinthians 16.22, and you wonder why there's people that hate Paul and deny Paul as an apostle. Listen to this. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Anathema means cursed. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be cursed. Is there a group of people in the Middle East that hate Jesus Christ? Oh yeah. Just give a call to your local sin of Gog and ask them if Jesus is the Christ. And when they say no, well, there you know. There you go. You got you know who the antichrist is, of which there's more than one, there's many. You want to know how much God has blessed America? Well, let me tell you something. In 1905, there was a communist revolution in Russia. It failed. And um the same group that runs the banks in America was financing that revolution in Russia. But it failed. But in 1917, 12 years later, they had another revolution, and this one succeeded. And in the 1920s, well, they were uh, exterminating Christians by the millions Matter of fact, uh, in Ukraine, I heard that they killed approximately a quarter of the population. And Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe. I mean, it was sort of like uh, Kansas and Nebraska and the United States, where they grow all the food. So they killed the Christian farmers. And then God sent uh, some bad weather. I don't remember exactly if it was a, a a frost in the spring that killed the crops or if it was a lack of rain. I don't remember. I mean, it's been a long time since I've studied this stuff. But there was a huge crop failure. And, you know, 
that kind of stuff happens when you kill your farmers. Not very smart, you know. Killing your farmers is not a very smart thing to do. But, uh, so the communists were under, I mean, they were on a starvation diet, basically. There was no food in communist Russia. Virtually none. People were starving. And, um, you know, that's what usually happens when you kill your Christian farmers. God sends a plague. Either he kills the crops with uh, a late frost or there's no rain. So what did the United States do instead of letting them suffer? The United States sent them millions of tons of wheat to feed the communists after they murdered all the Christians in Russia. So, how did God bless America? They had a thing called the Dust Bowl. There was no rain. All the crops died. The land turned to dust and powder. There were sandstorms in the United States. Sandstorms. It was horrible. Look up the Dust Bowl. That was God blessing the United States for feeding those that murdered the Christians. But do you think we listened? No. No. Did America get on their hands and knees and repent? No. Uh, I don't remember the exact years of the Dust Bowl, but, uh, you know, we had the Roaring Twenties. Matter of fact, let me look that up a little bit. All right. Yep, it was in the early 30s. Um, so remember something. We fed the communists in the 20s. We had the uh, so-called economic boom of the Roaring Twenties, as they called it. But then in 1929, we had the Great Depression, the crash, the stock market crash. The next stock market crash is going to be totally different because people have no respect for each other now. This time, instead of standing in soup lines, they're going to be killing each other and burning and looting and rioting. So... We fed the communists in the 20s. Stock market crashed in 29. And then we had the Dust Bowl in the 30, early 30s. God was sending a message to America. What happened after that? World War II. 1939, right? Well, for us, it was 1941. And don't kid yourself. Look it up, people. I'm not full of it. Um, there, one of the, the third largest island in the Hawaiian island chain is called Hilo, H-I-L-O. The week before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Hilo newspaper, I think it was November 30th or November 31st, the week before Pearl Harbor happened, the Hilo newspaper said that Japan was expected to attack over the weekend. Really? So you're going to tell me a newspaper knew about the attack, but the United States military intelligence didn't know? Really? Our aircraft carriers, the most important capital ships that we owned that were modern, were out to sea. All the battleships that were in Pearl Harbor were World War I junk. They were obsolete. They were slow. Uh, they didn't have the modern sighting systems. I mean, you know, when the, you're shooting at something, you know, those things could shoot at something 15, 20 miles away. But when you'd fire 100 shells, you might get one hit with those old World War I battleships. Uh, the modern battleships could hit from 20 miles away uh, an Iowa-class battleship with its 16-inch uh, diameter guns. Um, from 20 miles away, 
with the sighting system that they had, the ranging sighting system they had, could hit within a, a football field um, from 20 miles away. Now, it might take you four or five shots to hit a ship in that football field, but uh, they were, you know, they were modern. They were accurate, fairly accurate. But the World War I battleships were junk compared to what was being fielded by the Japanese Navy. They knew. You know, we would have never, we would have probably never gone to war had God been blessing us. America's under God's curse. And then in 1948, what did we do? Uh, we created a the um, helped create the one world what they want to have is the one world government the United Nations okay the UN and what was the what was the first thing that the United Nations did 1948 they said they proclaimed that the Israeli state was born and your preachers will tell you that that was the uh, Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Mm, they're half right. Uh, personally, I think they're partly right. But I'm thinking the wheat, the parable of the wheat and the tares. The tares being gathered to be burned. Whereas they're saying, oh, well, that's the regathering of Israel. Uh, I think it's the tares being gathered the Antichrist. But if you notice, every time America has fought a communist country, we've lost. Look at Cuba. Look at North Korea. The Korean War. Look at Vietnam. We have never won a war against a communist country. Never. Why? Wall Street. Wall Street's behind communism because they want... Well, they, it's like uh, you own a racetrack and you own all the horses. No matter who wins and who loses, you're still ahead. Look at China. China was a third world country. Now they have a huge navy, an air force, and a huge military. Matter of fact, in the um, book of Revelation, it talks about a 200 million man army. China could feel that army by themselves. I mean, after all, they have 1.5 billion people. That's 1,500 million people. Even if half that's women... That still leaves you with 750 million people. And then you take half of that. That's still 350 million. You know, um, let's say half the people are under 18 and half are over 40. That still gives you 350 million to, to choose from. I mean, you know, out of that 350 million, you could come up with a 250 million man army. I'm not saying that's the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, but I'm just pointing it out that this is the first time in the history of the world that there's ever been a country that could field an army of that size in light of Bible prophecy. Whether it'll come to pass, I don't know. You know, there's technology today where they could actually implement the mark of the beast. I mean, look at it, people. Your passport. Your ID 2020, your um, driver's licenses, your ATM, your credit cards, they all have chips. You could lose your credit card. You could lose your ATM card. You could lose your government ID. But what if they put that chip in your hand? What if somebody going to cut your hand off and take it to the bank and say, I'd like to, to uh, uh, have a withdrawal of some money? Be a little difficult, don't you think? You know, there's some... This is the first time in history that uh, 
Everything's tied into computers. Everything. Everything. They go, they, you know, you send an email, you talk on the phone, they record everything, they listen to everything. That's why I like talking about Jesus. They can, they can listen about Jesus. Of course, I haven't done a lot of Bible studies on this lesson. I'm just pointing some things out. But um, this is why you've got the great falling away. It all started with the pulpit, the preachers, the pastors. They're, they teach lies for gain. Why? Because they work for the enemy. They don't work for the Lord. I mean, if they work for the Lord, wouldn't they warn you that the Lord has enemies? And if you're one of the Lord's sheep, that means they're your enemies. But nobody, hardly anybody ever warns you about the Lord's enemies. It's, it's sad. Ah. <sighs> So what's going to happen is um, these churchgoers are, that have no spiritual discernment, have no love of Jesus, if anything, if they're even lukewarm for Jesus, it's a miracle, virtually. So, you know, they're, uh, they're pretty much the enemies of the cross of Christ. I mean, here it is, they bless the people that curse and hate Jesus. So, in the next lesson, I'm going to start going through specific false doctrines that have consequences, like the pre-trib rapture. What's going to happen to the faith of millions of Christians when they find out that they're either going to have to deny Jesus to save their miserable lives, when Jesus said if you denied him before men that he would deny you before the Father and his angels, or get their heads cut off. Noahide laws, N-O-A-H-I-D-E. The laws are on the books right now. I heard Reagan, Bush, Obama, Clinton, they all signed off on those laws. They're on the books. They're just not being enforced yet. The New Testament is in danger of being banned as being hate speech. Do you know there was a time Back in the early history, especially the states up in the Northeast, the original 13 colonies, they have laws on the books today from their state constitution. Not the United States federal constitution, but the states have constitutions also. There were laws on the books that said that to be an elected official, a public official, you had to be a professing Christian. What a joke. A very sick joke. Now you have dual citizens, antichrists, that are that hate Jesus. And they're your elected officials. I think it was Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, that said, um, if voting changed anything... It would be illegal. Oh, yeah. People read Revelation chapter 12. I did a video on it. Um, the woman is the church of Revelation chapter 12. The bride of Christ. And let me tell you something. There's going to come a day when the wilderness is going to be the only place for the bride of Christ. Either that or the guillotine. And I've seen images of what looks like invoices of a, a guillotine company 
in France that sold the United States government guillotines. I heard 30,000, but uh, other people have told me it's far more than that. And uh, beheading people. Matter of fact, that's in the Bible. Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's another verse where uh, John said that uh, he saw under the altar of God uh, the souls of them that were beheaded for Christ. Well, that were he saw the souls of those that had died for Christ. Uh, that's another false teaching that they teach is uh, something that they call soul sleep. They teach that when you die, you don't exist in any kind of form until the Lord resurrects your body. But that's not true. The Jehovah's Witnesses are famous for teaching that false doctrine. And that's in Revelation verse uh, chapter 6 and verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. There you go. Does that sound like, oh, and then the next verse, let's read verse 10. And they cried. Who cried? The souls. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Pre-tribbers would have you tell you that, well, you know, everybody else is at the banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb, but these guys are just kind of hanging around. Uh, but they, they missed the rapture, so they had to die for their faith. And they missed the marriage supper of the Lamb because, you know, they didn't believe they didn't believe in the pre-trib rapture, so they were left behind. Where's that in the Bible? If you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, you're not going to get raptured. Where's that in the Bible? And yet there's people that teach this junk. The great falling away people. Where do they come up with this stuff? Oh, wait, I know. The devil. Yeah. I tell you what, the pre-trib rapture is going to ruin the faith of millions. Millions. All right, let's take a look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Another one of Paul's works, which all these Hebrew roots, sacred name deceivers want you to think that Paul is a false apostle. Yeah, the book of Acts is wrong. All of Paul's writings are wrong. And the Holy Spirit failed to tell the apostles that Paul was a, a heretic from Satan. That's what they want you to believe. Because they want to convince you not to believe Paul. Paul gives you a lot of warnings that are not in the Gospels. A lot. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now gals and those guys that have never been in the military, let me tell you something. The life of a soldier is not a bed of roses. Well, maybe it is with all the thorns, but um, it's not an easy life. I was in the military. And um, that's why he tells you, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth 
entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Boy, I could sure take those words to heart myself. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. In other words, the guy that works in the vineyard, the guy that works in the orchard, he's going to be the first one to partake of the, the good, you know. If he's taking care of an apple tree, he's going to be the first one to get the good apples. Verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Very important. Jesus was raised from the dead. Verse 9, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, dead in the flesh, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. In the spirit, right? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And I mentioned this in the last study. The worst words you could ever hear in your whole life is, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And to be cast into outer darkness. That's, no. I want to hear, uh, Well done, thou faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. That's what I want to hear. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. In other words, don't argue about stupid stuff. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved under God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And boy, that verse is terribly mishandled. But shun profane and vain babblings. Uh, babbling means confusion. And vain means worthless. But shun profane and worthless babblings, vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetius. I hope I'm pronouncing those right. I don't speak Greek. Verse 18, listen to this very, very carefully. I'll read it twice. Who concerning the truth have erred, what does erred mean? It, it's where we get the word error. It means they're wrong. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is already past and overthrow the faith of some. What's the resurrection? Well, that's what some people call the rapture. Listen to this. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the rapture or the resurrection is all, past already and overthrow the faith of some. Ooh, you missed the rapture. And that's going to overthrow the faith of some. You know, if Satan did this almost 2,000 years ago, well, 1,900 plus years ago, wouldn't he pull that thing today? You missed the rapture. You weren't rapture ready. You weren't looking up. You didn't believe in the pre-trib rapture, so you weren't taken. 
Yeah, maybe they were taken by um, the wicked ones to have be executed. Maybe that's why they're not here. I don't know. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. I'd rather have the seal of God than the mark of the beast, but that's just me. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I hope to strive for that one day. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. Boy, I wish I'd have done that. But follow righteousness, faith, charity. And that word charity is sometimes translated as love. Depends on the context and where it is. But um, the word charity and love is pretty much used interchangeably in the Greek. Because if you have love, you'll have charity. And if you have charity, you're showing forth your love. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. And they'll tell you that Paul is a false apostle. Does this sound like a false apostle? You know, those that have ears to hear will hear. And, uh, you know, it's always a satanic serpent seed line that's behind all these attacks. For example, people will tell you the Bible's wrong. Well, I don't believe the King James Bible's wrong. Just because you don't understand something doesn't mean that it's wrong. And besides, if the Bible was mistranslated and God's word was lost, that would mean Satan's more powerful than God. God was unable to preserve his word. But not only that, but the devil would need to have 666 different versions of the Bible. He wouldn't need to do that because it was already corrupted, right? I mean, there'd only be one corrupted version of the Bible. But that's why there's 666 different versions of the Bible because he doesn't want you to read his word, God's word. He wants you to read Satan's interpretation of God's word. Like the living, uh, the, the living, which I call the spiritually dead Bible, or the uh, bad news for modern man, or the NIV, the not inspired version, or the Nazi inspired version, because the... Uh, the Greek was from a New Testament word book that was from a Nazi named Kittle. Ah, you never heard about that, huh? Yeah, Bible cemeteries, I mean cemeteries, sem seminaries, cemeteries, I was right the first time, use a book by Gerhard Kittle. The guy was a Nazi. And, you know, I hear all these people proclaiming how great Hitler was. Well, if Hitler was doing God's work, why did he lose the war? Huh? Can anybody explain that to me? I mean, he was a politician, and what he said and what he did was two different things. I mean, you know, what can I tell you? So if Hitler's your savior, get yourself a swastika, put it on your arm, march around with doing Heil Hitlers and praise Hitler. But uh, I'll take Jesus. Thank you very much. 
But um, can you imagine a Nazi for the, uh, the New Testament Greek? I think I'll pass, really, you know? But uh, that's where people will look at this Nazi's dictionary and take his word definitions and then go to the King James and said, well, you see, this word is wrong. What it really means in the Greek is probably the opposite of what the King James says. And they think that they're great scholars. They're not. So, all right, well, I've been ranting and raving for 80 minutes. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All glory to them. In Jesus' precious name, amen.